All right. Hello, hello, hello. Let me just go ahead and slide in here. Oh, I never updated this version of that. Hold on, give me one second. Just, just give me one second. I gotta, just real quick. I gotta change my body suit. Hold on. Hold on. Let me just, let me just get in this. Ugh. Okay. Okay. Alright, we're good now. We're good. We're good. Hold up. Where am I? Here I am. Hello. Welcome to the Shark Stream Book Club. It's me. It's Gage. Can you believe it? Again? Like, here we are. We're not done with Alan Wake yet. Can you just... Can you believe that shit? I have a little assistant today. Because I sat down to get ready for this stream... And Calamity pretty much immediately crawled into my lap. Hello, Calamity. Are you going to be my assistant today, or now that I'm talking so much, are you going to, like, move to a different part of the room? Hmm? Hello. Little girl. Hello. Oh, you're so cute. Um. But yes. Hi. Hi. Today, we will be... She is looking up at me. She is so cute. You are just the cutest. You're so cute. When you're purring... Uh, what am I talking about? Today. Today. Uh, we will be diving into the Alan Wake Files. Now, the Alan Wake Files were... What do you see, Mitty? Mitty, what do your elf eyes... What do your elf eyes see? She is locked on to something. It's out there. Is there a void? You see a void? Is there a void in the tree? I don't see anything. Hello, Mitty. Oh, jeez. Bending the dust jacket inadvertently. Uh, the Alan Wake Files um, was a... Uh, physical book released with the collector's edition of Alan Wake back all the way back in 2010. And while it was definitely um, while it was released all the way back then it still has a lot of relevance to things we know and things we are kind of moving forward towards with regards to like future Alan Wake projects things like Control things like Alan Wake 2 so getting the inf what information we can from it is incredibly relevant hello Indoto welcome to the Sharkstream book club pull up a chair pull up a chair and get ready to get get ready for these files, these Alan Wake files. I still have this book on my shelf somewhere. It's it's good. Like it's genuinely I fucking love this thing. Remember I I love so okay. I'm beating around the bush here a little bit. The Alan Wake files is a book that is written as if it is in it's essentially it's in it's an in-universe piece of media like it is written by a character from alan wake who we will be discussing in a moment here um about the events of the game and about sort of like uh follow-up to the events of the game uh showing that they kind of like beat twin peaks by a few years um this is very similar to uh the Secret History of Twin Peaks and the Final Dossier, uh, which were released in the late 2010s. Um, which, if you're a Twin Peaks fan, I highly recommend checking out both of those books. Um, and especially getting, like, the audiobooks, uh, for sure. The audiobooks of those are really good. And, um, some of the, like, handwritten, uh, things in A Secret History of Twin Peaks... Um, really benefits from having the audiobook because it's otherwise very hard to read. Um, but yeah, this whole 
thing is set up like it is just sort of like something that was published in the universe of Alan Wake. Um, the author profile, the uh, summary of the book, the <laughs> quotes on the back from like reviews. Um, so I want to go ahead and start out with that and go over those real quick. So the Alan Wake Files uh, is a series of uh, written essays and uh, bits of literature compiled by uh, Clay Stewart. Now, if that name sounds familiar to you, he was the dude in the Letterman jacket that we met in the dream at the beginning of Alan Wake, who helped us uh, across the bridge and into the cabin, and then was murdered by the hitchhiker. We ran up to him just like, Mr. Wake, it's me, Clay Stewart, remember? And it's just like, we don't remember, because he hasn't become relevant yet. But now he is. Uh, Clay Stewart lives in Madison, Wisconsin, where he works as a library assistant. He has been published in Zone Quarterly, The Whole Truth Newsletter, and Rising Tide, and is currently at work on a psycho-literary analysis of the literature of H.P. Lovecraft entitled The Alchemist. Um, and the uh, image on the cover, uh, which you can see uh, displayed on our helpful little Sharkstream book club uh, banner here on the right, um, is listed as being photograph a photograph by Barry Wheeler. A brave and deeply disturbing account of one man... This music's a little loud, I'm going to crank it down a little bit. A brave and disturbing and deeply disturbing account of one man's attempt to confront the visions that haunted him. Clay Stewart's gripping journey takes him to a small town in the Pacific Northwest, where he follows in the tracks of best-selling author Alan Wake and renegade FBI agent Robert Nightingale. There he travels ever deeper in the woods and ever farther into the heart of darkness to unravel a series of mysterious events that reach hundreds of years into the past and chillingly into the present. So, primarily, we're going to be looking at some information left behind by uh, Robert Nightingale. I've pointed this out before. In in the game, if you go to Robert Nightingale's room in um, uh, The Majestic, uh, in the final chapter, up in the vent, you can see a bunch of papers sticking out. Those are the eponymous Alan Wake files, or the titular Alan Wake files. Um most of this stuff is files compile like dug up by robert nightingale some of his notes and various other pieces of information that he has amassed over the years and the whole thing is compiled for publishing by clay stewart um so primarily like i said we're going to be focusing this book is going to focus on alan wake himself and robert nightingale who compiled a lot of this stuff now i want to go ahead and read um <laughs> <laughs> the review quotes on the back because um while clay stewart is um as we're going to find out soon plagued by very real things um that are reaching out to him as a result of the events that surrounded cauldron lake um the literary world at large does not necessarily take him seriously so, here's the first quote on the, on the back of the book. Mr. Stewart's investigative work serves as a forceful example to truth seekers everywhere. His ever-questioning mind probes into matters most of us would prefer left untouched. An inspirational and frightening account of his journey. Four stars. The Whole Truth Newsletter. I couldn't put the Alan Wake files down, and I doubt that many of my listeners will either. Scary stuff. Keith Vincent host of KBZR AM's End Times with Keith Vincent. While containing no direct accounts of alien abduction, the Alan Wake Files presents a chilling study that experienced ufologists. Is it ufologists? Is it ufologists? I don't actually know. I'm going to say ufologists. That experienced ufologists will recognize from the case literature as a pre-close encounter. Can the mothership be far off? One can only anticipate with awe and trembling the next news we hear from Bright Falls. Close Encounters Quarterly. 
Bright Falls certainly deserves an entry in the Encyclopedia of Unsolved Mysteries. Cliff Gantry, author of The Brown Note and Other Secret Weapons. You know, The Brown Note. The note that makes you shit. Provocative. Unnerving. Spellbinding. Kept me up for more than a few nights. Ted Mitchell, author of Sasquatch. I have to say Sasquatch like that because there's like an exclamation point at the end of it. Minnie, how do you feel about that? Sasquatch. Mitty is nonchalant as always. Riveting reviews from trustworthy sources. Exactly. Eggs. So, uh, let's go ahead and get started here. I have, uh, I think this is the first hardcover book I've read on the Shark Stream. I'm trying to think, what else, what else did I read on the Shark Stream book club? I read, um, oh god, what have I, what have I read on here? I read, uh, Dead Space Martyr, uh, Dark Siders the Abomination book, or the, the Ab Abomination Vault, not the Abomination book, and the novelization of Alan Wake, so... This is the first uh, actual like hardcover book. I had a I had a little I had a, I had a little little wetness on that H there. Some some spit gurgled up in my throat. <laughs> um but this is the first hardcover book I'll be reading on stream. So I've gone ahead and removed the dust jacket as I usually do for hardcover book books. Um, dust jackets are really nice, but, like, I find them, like, very unwieldy when I'm trying to read a hardcover book to have to, like, fiddle with the dust jacket every few minutes. So these days I've actually been finding myself just removing them entirely. Which, like, is fine, because if you've ever looked at, like, a hardcover book without the dust jacket, like, it's usually, like, a very sort of appealing minimalist look. Like, um, this, the... The cover is entirely just black, but on the front cover they've got the um, torch symbol that's drawn around like caches of supplies in the game. It's very cool. So let's go ahead and get in here. The Alan Wake Files, compiled by Clay Stewart. To all those who walk in light. Preface. The book you hold in your hands represents the end of one life and the beginning of another. My name is Clay Stewart, and I began on this path when a series of strange dreams turned out to be visions of a real man, a town in trouble, and a powerful destructive force beyond my imagining. Two years ago, if someone had asked me who Alan Wake was, or where the town of Bright Falls was located, I would have been stumped on both counts. My life had, up to that point, been untouched by either of these particulars, and perhaps for the better, but I cannot change the past can only try to make sense of it, and with the publication of this book perhaps gain some measure of forgiveness from those I heard along the way. I will explain how I became involved in these events, but if there is one thing I need you to understand, it's that the strange disturbances that shook Bright Falls in the weeks preceding the Deerfest of last year represent one of the greatest mysteries of our time. This book began as a personal attempt to understand and solve those mysteries. Now I fear that may be impossible. I hope merely to exercise them, and by doing so, to relinquish their claims upon me. I lived a quiet life in Madison, Wisconsin, until the dreams started, recurring dreams, all pointing me to a particular place. My first dream was nothing at all. I'm alone, in a cabin in the night. Someone knocks, and I step out onto the porch. There's no one there, but the lantern is broken in what I take to be a very meaningful way. That's how it strikes me. The second dream is the same as the first, except that after I find the broken lamp, I hear something in the forest, and I think I see movement. 
I follow it to the forest's edge, but then it stops. The third dream follows the course of dreams one and two, except the sounds get louder and louder. Trees fall, and it's as though I am caught in a storm. I run away and down the road until I get till I get to the ocean. There's a lighthouse, and it's obvious to my dream logic that I will be safe there. A man holds the lighthouse door open and frantically waves me toward him. I run and run, chased by this thing, this dark omnipresence, and in the last possible moment I'm consumed. I cease to exist. Soon I'm having these dreams every night, and it's the same each time. I'm chased by this donk- donk? I'm chased by this fucking donk. I'm, ch <laughs> I'm chased by this dark monster or men consumed by shadows, and again and again I see this man in his early 30s with a strong but friendly face. Sometimes I save his life, other times he saves mine, but we always die in the end. I start staying up later and later trying to avoid sleep. My wife and my little boy are safe in their beds and I'm up at 3am watching the tube, surfing through a wasteland of softcore soap and slaughter, trying to stay awake. But you can't stay awake forever. Late one night I'm watching reruns of that old show, Night Springs, but I keep nodding off. In the twilight between dreaming and waking I hear the voice of the man from my dreams. He's talking to me, he is talking to me, saying, I'm not interested in literary cliques or in questions of genre versus literary fiction. I want a good story, well told, and I'll take it where I can get it. My eyes flitter open and there he is, the nameless man from my dreams. He's on my freaking television set, being interviewed at a round wooden table with two other men. I almost leap from the couch and I am more awake than I ever have been in my life. I watch and watch, until another question is directed at this man and the caption appears. Alan Wake, author of The Sudden Stop. It's entirely possible, even likely, that, considering Wake's fame, I had seen his picture before and performed some unconscious copy-paste work, but I knew things about him from my visions, things that I hadn't read. In the days following my discovery, I obsessively researched his writings, read everything I could get my hands on, and it only confirmed that he was the same man with whom I had been trapped in my nightly hellscape. His detective, Alex Casey, resembled him, and they shared the same grim humor, even when death felt certain. I was convinced that my dreams represented a shared experience with Alan Wake. More than that, they were a warning. I wrote a long and impassioned letter to Mr. Wake's publishers, but only received a postcard noting my letter's receipt and encouraging me to purchase Wake's latest book. Every time I re-entered the dream world, I became an obsessive observer of this strange dimension, which seemed to be an underwater world populated by unknowable, dark forces, whose only desire was to destroy me. I was a diligent transcriber of these awful visions, and every time I woke, I updated the dream journal I had started. My wife Anna and I hardly spoke anymore, and I felt myself becoming increasingly disengaged from my former life. The journal was the one thing that helped me make sense of what I was experiencing. The dreams continued, becoming more and more horrific over the following months. Only one thing was clear, Alan Wake was somehow at the center of what I was experiencing. In fact, he was the cause of everything I was experiencing. Each night, I was killed, or I witnessed others killed. Finally, I saw a small town destroyed and a whole world consumed by darkness. And it was all his fault. I didn't blame him for it, but I had to make contact with him to tell him what I'd seen to warn him. While researching lighthouses at the university library, I happened upon an image of the lighthouse from my dreams. This hit me like a thunderclap. It was located outside a town called Bright Falls. An internet image search revealed a scrapbook of my visions. Here it was, this small, picturesque town in Washington state. Fishing, logging, bad weather, the buildings, streets, and bridges were those from my nightmares. I had seen it all before. I couldn't deny it anymore, my decision was made for me. I bought a $165 ticket on a Greyhound bus and arrived in Bright Falls two days later. I'll admit that things didn't feel right from the beginning. I've lived in enough Midwestern shitbergs to know what economic blight looks like up close, and this wasn't that. Something had happened here. There were bullet holes in buildings and general air of civil disturbance. There was talk of tornadoes and a troubling number of women dressed in mourning clothes. There were three funerals the first day, all held for local fathers and husbands and wives, all held in absentia. When I asked people what had happened here, some mentioned freak storms and an annual town party that was preceded by horrible accidents. Most would not reply at all. 
They shook their heads and walked away, that stricken look of survivor guilt crimping their faces. They avoided my questions as though I was probing into some town shame, some big secret no one dared reveal. I know how strange that sounds, but it felt as though the whole town was being held hostage. Like they'd been told they were being watched, and that if they spoke to anyone, there would be more deaths, and more after that. I checked into room number two at the Majestic Motel. It smelled of stale alcohol and cigarettes with a fair dose of what I now recognize as fear sweat. I had no idea how long I would spend there, but I unpacked my bags, all except for my dream journal. I took my pocket knife from my backpack and drew out the Phillips head, climbing up to the air vent and unscrewed the panel, thinking myself very clever even though I'd seen this trick in a couple movies. Well, I guess someone else had too, because it was there that I found the green cardboard box. I pulled it out and opened it up on the bed, a cache of documents some three thick manila folders thick. When I saw the name of its author, I understood that this was the end of another's journey. Special Agent Robert Nightingale of the FBI. My months of pain, my disintegrating marriage, my confusion all washed through me. This is what the dreams had pointed to. This room in Bright Falls, Washington. There are some who will question the authenticity of my find and consider it an elaborate hoax, or the product of a broken mind, but I am not deterred. The longer I spent with Nightingale's dossier, the more I became convinced that I had found a fellow traveler. He may have been a drunk, insane with grief, or a kind of madness that has no name, but he was onto something, as my own subsequent investigation has proven. Alan Wake had just been to Bright Falls. His wife Alice had disappeared, a series of chaotic and unexplained events leading to missing and dead persons, the destruction of buildings, reports of shadow men and monsters followed soon after. I had arrived at the edge of a great and foreboding secret. I set out for the Majestic the next day to search out the truth for myself. Clay Stewart. Hold on, I gotta get the fucking thing I'm using as a goddamn bookmark. Okay. So. Here we are. Born to be kings. We're the princes of the universe. So first things first. Just from the preface, we now know that this book was written one year, or the preface at least was written, one year after the events of Alan Wake. So, if we assume that Alan Wake happened in 2010, right, then, which I think that is the assumption, I believe that documents you find in control establish that yes, it happened in 2010, then this book would have been uh, written and published in 2011. Um, and as it is established here, um, Clay Stewart, prior to the actual events of the, ga the game, had been having weird-ass dreams for what seems like weeks, if not months. Now, the implication... Hold on. Oh, hold on one second. The implication seems to be that these dreams were shared experiences between him and Wake. Now, Alan probably wrote them off mainly as, like, just weird, fucked-up dreams that we, he was having. Manifestations of his own anxieties. And I mean, you know, looking at the dream that we do see in the game, it's understandable uh, to think that that's the case. 
you know, it's it's about a hitchhiker from a story he was writing telling him that he sucks at writing. Sounds like pretty standard, like, fucked up nightmare fare to me. But Clay Stewart kept a dream journal. Clay Stewart recognized that, hey, I keep having these dreams with these sa with this same guy in it, with these similar themes and everything. So, when we get to the dream at the start of the game, Clay Stewart already knows what's going on. He already recognizes Wake. He already knows how these always play out. And he has been, in the waking world, trying to get Alan Wake's attention to say, like, Hey, I'm having some fucking weird-ass premonitions. You need to listen to me. Um, and unfortunately, he never gets the chance to get in touch with Wake properly before the events of the game happen. And Bright Falls is fucking racked by all this shit that goes on. Um... So, Clay Stewart decides, okay, I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. He starts, in addition to keeping his dream journal, he starts, like, looking up everything he can about Wake, reading all of his work, just everything. And then, he finds out about the lighthouse in the dreams. Now, he mentions that the lighthouse is outside of Bright Falls. A couple important things to note. Now, the Bright Falls Lighthouse, outside of the dream at the beginning, never shows up in-game properly. It shows up in a dream at the beginning of the game, and it shows up in Alan's, like, fucked-up mental landscape in uh, The Writer, the second DLC episode. Um, that being said... It does show up in earlier builds of the game and was a location that you went to. In some builds of the game, it showed up. It was like a location that you meet um, Rusty at. Because Rusty originally played like a much larger role um, with, uh, with the plot. Lost my train of thought for a second there. Just totally stalled out. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, is the music... Okay, it did loop. Okay. I just gotta... I gotta make sure that everything's working prop properly. Um... Now, Clay Stewart finally shows up in Bright Falls after the events of the game and Deerfest have concluded. And kind of learns about everything secondhand. Um, now, in the game, when you reach the end of it, it's it's play, it plays out like a happy ending to, to an extent. It's kind of a bittersweet ending where it's just like, Alice is rescued... The town is more or less saved, the darkness is defeated, but Alan is still stuck in the cabin in Cauldron Lake. Um, but here's the thing. 
those events happened. The events of the game happened in Bright Falls. The, the book does a really good job of establishing, the novelization does a really good job of establishing that all of the people that you fight as Taken, every single one of them, not just like the the big ones that you fight, like Stucky or Rusty or Birch, um, they're all people like in town, from town, visiting town, so on and so forth. And it is admittedly a little weird to think about how, hey, there's a lot of people that have probably... Like, there's missing posters put up and everything. There's a lot of people who had to have gone missing. And Alan Wake Files establishes, yeah, there's a lot of people who are, are at this point, just assumed dead. Funerals are held for them. Funerals with empty caskets because there's nothing left to bury. And like, that's kind of fucked up, right? It's this a that's a that's a little fucked up. That's a that's a little that's a little dark, to if you'll excuse the pun. And then. Clay Stewart find, find, find? Clay Stewart find document. Clay Stewart finds Nightingale's dossier on Alan Wake. Hidden in the vent, just like I said. I still think it's really cool that they put that in the game, that that's just something you can fucking find. That's, that's really cool. Like, you can't, like examine them or anything but you see them in the vent it's a really neat little touch even though based on the alan wake files uh they were all the way in the vent and he had to open it to find them though who knows he might be uh embellishing it a little bit uh so yeah this is how our story starts with uh Clay Stewart finding just all of this stuff already, like, compiled and everything. A little fucky-wucky. little fucko boingo Um. And now it's up... It's, now it's up to our good buddy Clay to put all this together for us in a way that makes sense. Now, this game... This book doesn't have, like... Uh sort of normal chapters um there are different sections of the book you've got field notes from agent nightingale um interviews with a series of interviews nightingale i think night it's nightingale's interviews um a number of manuscript pages uh some of alan wake's uh fiction works um, a couple pieces of nonfiction, uh, some books relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, and then, is 115 just all, is the one on 115 just all images? No, it's not. And then just, like, a number of, like, articles and exhibits. And then an afterword. Uh, so we're gonna be starting here with Nightingale's Field Notes. The handwritten notes found among Agent Nightingale's effects form perhaps the most telling document in the collection about his internal struggle as he pursued Alan Wake. The mixture of driving forces creates a maelstrom of turbulence inside a man, not unlike Wake, trying to hold himself together while pursuing a quixotic goal. The notes are presented here in facsimile form to give readers the same sense of physical texture I found when I discovered them. Here, Nightingale inadvertently exposes his, his tortured ambivalence alongside his dogged determination. 
these ghosts from his past battle with the demons he meets in his present. As for his future, there seems to be nothing brighter than doubt. It is unclear whether this cache represents the entirety of the notes he took, or simply a portion. They do, however, suggest that Nightingale was at the breaking point, both physically and mentally. Whether the abrupt end of his field notes was the result of sheer exhaustion or the, on the agent's part, or another more nefarious explanation, I am unable to determine. So each of these um, is... Uh, it's basically as though the notes themselves were, like, photocopied, and then, um, like, just kind of printed as an image on the page. And, oh yeah, I die a bunch during this footage, by the way. I did not do a good job playing through the writer. Or the signal, rather. Day one. Night. Exhausted. I missed the turnoff. Took two hours longer than planned. Trees are pretty, but hell, they all look alike. This place really is in the middle of nowhere. And not the exact middle, that would be too easy. The sun's already down. The hotel stinks and not even in a good and not even in a good Chicago way. Majestic my ass. Gotta check in with a local Johnny Law in the morning. Haven't really grilled the local yokels yet. Don't think the moron at the front desk counts. Wish I had the Bureau's backing. Some official resources would help, but then there's a, there'd be a lot of explaining to do. I've got no better way to burn my free time. Still have a few favors I can call in if I need some heavy lifting. Better this way. Day 2. Johnny Law turns out to be Janie Law. Sheriff Breaker comes from a cop family. Knows diddly squat. Usual hostility to feds. Don't know whether to use honey or salt on this one. Don't know if I have enough honey in me. She did make the phone call I needed. Let's consider her pliable. Diner's a great place to get all friendly with the townies. They had a cardboard cutout awake propped up near the door. One of the waitresses is supposed to be a big fan. When I talked to Sheriff Breaker later, she revealed a different point of view than one Agent Nightingale expresses here. She believed their relationship was cordial and cooperative. The hostility she speaks of here may well reveal more about the agent's predisposition than any actual exchange between the two law enforcement officers. Breaker would not comment on the nature of the call she was asked to make. When I asked about, and I, when I asked her about Agent Nightingale's current whereabouts, she turned around and wished me luck. Her interview at an end. Day two, afternoon. How to get to our boy before he hurts anyone? That's the million-dollar question. These people know what they're dealing with here. Good God, it's like watching toddlers play with nitro. Interviewed locals at trailer park. Suspect there's all suspect there's something behind all these dopey country facades. Everyone knows more than they're telling. Maybe they just don't, which is even scarier. We did a number on that waitress. Sweet kid, but can't tell night from day. When Nightingale refers to our boy, it can only be assumed he means Alan Wake. What is not clear is why Nightingale is so afraid of what Wake might do. Although Wake has a history of erratic behavior, he is not associated with anything that would give the ex an experienced FBI agent concern. Nightingale seems equally unnerved and suspicious of the locals, and more than that, he evidences a genuine fear of an undetermined someone, or something. Uh, so there's actually a number of uh, photographs in the book. Um, because I'm not using a visual aid for this, which is mostly because, like, I'm already kind of skirting copyright a little bit here by reading this in the way that I am. Um, like, I think what I'm doing just barely probably covers, like, pr transformative works, you know, making the discussion and inserting things uh, into the reading. Uh, but I feel like uh, actually showing images of the pages would probably be a step too far. This is why I'm, uh... Uh... Considering how to do, like, a book club for the Archie Sonic comics. Um, one of the first photos in the book is of the lighthouse. Um... And the caption for it reads, The lighthouse at Rain Cove Point near Bright Falls, just as it appeared in my recurring dreams. 
At the start of Nightingale's Field Notes, uh, there is a billboard for the annual Bright Falls Deer Festival Cuisine Trophies Hunting Family Fund. Uh, captioned for it reads, The cheery sign that welcomed Alan Wake, Agent Nightingale, and myself to Bright Falls. Uh, during... Uh, I'm going to sneeze. Hey, Excuse me. Uh, during the uh, first analysis that Clay writes... Uh, where he d discusses talking to Sheriff Breaker. Um, it includes a photo that is apparent was apparently taken by Agent Nightingale. Uh, caption reads, Sheriff Breaker not pleased to see Agent Nightingale's camera. Um, the photo that accompanies the... Bladed bless you. Thank you. The photo that accompanies the analysis that we just read is of the uh, crashed car that you wake up in in the middle of episode one um with a caption based on the license plates this car had been rented by alan wake or Al rented by alice wake it's a know whether nightingale's examination of the crash yielded any leads to her whereabouts or those of her husband day three noises last night some damn animals went out again got lost again Goddamn trees. Can't believe how slippery some guys are. Talked to the front desk moron this morning. Didn't seem to know zip about Wake. Got real quiet when I mentioned him, in fact. Could be he just ran out of thoughts. Could be he just ran out of thoughts. I'm getting nothing out of these people. I have a... Hold on. Ugh. Oh, that sneeze did a number on me. Nightingale's commentary on his encounters with the motel staff revealed both his growing frustration with the pace of his, invest his investigation and his distrust of the locals. His reports of strange noises in the night, his confession to getting lost again, only served to highlight his vulnerability as he tries to navigate the unfamiliar terrain. Bright Falls represents a dangerous landscape to Nightingale, and perhaps to any others who cross its boundary. Uh, there's a photo here of, I believe, yep, this is Stucky's Gas Station. Uh, caption reads, Nightingale's photo of Stucky's gas station, which he would have seen upon his arrival to Bright Falls. It appears to have been abandoned. Day 3. Night. Scanner picked up confused distress call response. Domestic violence or burglary or vandalism or kidnapping. Deputy Dog can't decide. Little Janie Law's got her hands full. Things here are just strange enough that I'm sure I'm on the right track. Found Wake's agent, followed him a bit. Tubby tried to lose me. Maybe Wake's so slippery because his buddy's so slimy. It is difficult to break through Nightingale's tough law enforcement facade at times, even when he's writing his inner thoughts, but reading between the lines may be illuminative. While Nightingale's entry regarding the scanner audio may be nothing more than a small-town deputy handling routine crime calls, why would he bother noting them? Given his state of mind in the earlier entries, it seems more, more likely that Nightingale found the garbled distress call suggestive of paranormal activity. Uh, we've got a photo here of Main Street in Bright Falls. Uh, caption reads, The streets of Bright Falls in the days before Deerfest. Day 3. Practically 4. Can't go on like this. Daylight is harsh when there's no sleep. Saw Lady Diogenes with her lamp in broad daylight. I forget her real name. Got it written somewhere. How to get to Wake? Is someone hiding him? Extremism in the cause of sanity is no vice. Oh wait, hold on. Extremism in the cause of cause of sanity is no vice. Whatever it takes. Local head shrinker's name keeps coming up. Hartman. Nightingale's reference to Lady Diogenes refers to the Greek philosopher who walked around ancient Athens with a lamp during the day for the start stated purpose of looking for an honest man. Clearly he was referring to Cynthia Weaver, a well-known town eccentric who may have been more pre prescient about the dangers of darkness than anyone could have predicted. Also of note is the mention of Dr. Emil Hartman, who has been unresponsive to my interview requests. Later notes clearly show Nightingale to be suspicious of Hartman's practice at, at the Cauldron Lake Lodge. Uh, we got a photo here of Cynthia Weaver. Above, local res resident Cynthia Weaver and her ever-present lamp. Day 4. Didn't sleep a wink. Scanner just got weirder through the night. Wink is one elusive bugger. 
Is he the only one? Is it him holding up the whole t house of cards? What'll happen when I pull? Wish I could be sure. But not to decide is to... What? Wait, hold on. But not to decide is to decide. Have to do what's necessary when the time comes. Feels like I'm alone in the wilderness here. Nightingale's impatience toward the ends of these notes is palpable. This is the first instance where he questions Wake's status as a solitary force. Manifold questions remain, such as why he believed Wake to be such a source of danger. Had Nightingale been drawn to Bright Falls, as I was, by a series of dreams and nightmares? I'm compelled to think he was acting on harder evidence than was available to me. Could this be the ongoing investigation referred to in my FOIA request? See page 123. Uh, we got, like, a ravine here in the photo on the page. Uh, the desolate landscape surrounding Bright Falls seems pushed up out of the heart of the earth, rejected by the planet itself. Day 4. Afternoon. The partner isn't like a co-worker, or a friend, or even a brother. He's your guardian, your keeper, your other wife. He keeps you on the dead straight, calls you on everything the others let slide, and he has your back when the shooting starts. It's where I failed Finn. I owe it to him to keep going, even when everything's gone dark. When the craziness back east started, he couldn't explain it either. That's what he needed me most, but I blew it. I have to make it right. This is a rarity. One of the few instances where Nightingale reveals his heart and, consequently, some objective information about his motivations. That he lost a partner in the line of duty has been confirmed by my investigation, but the circumstances around that loss remain murky indeed. Clearly, he holds himself responsible in some fundamental way. Had Nightingale witnessed similar events before? How do these experiences transform him? Again, all we have, to, all we have is supposition and conjec conjecture. Uh, we got a photo of the train bridge uh, on this page. Despite hours of scrutiny, I have been unable to determine why Agent Nightingale chose to record this somber moment. Day four, night. Hartman seems to be the big man on campus, very protective of his patients. Skim through his self-help book. What a load. He's got a sweet little racket going at the lodge. Gut tells me he's involved in all this somehow. Going for a drive. Can't think in here. Am I going down like Finn? Not if I shoot first. Night, much later. Sounds are getting weirder all the time. Something happening just out of town, out by some farm. Flashes of light, too. Could be kids with firecrackers, getting edgy and starting a barn fire. Probably ought to get some batteries for this stupid flashlight if there's time. Will I have it in me to do what's necessary when the time comes? Okay. Get us out of here. Alright, so. We learn a little bit about Agent Nightingale through these notes. Now, Agent Nightingale, um, I've always kind of maintained, is supposed to be sort of like this kind of deconstruction of like the hard drinking, loose cannon cop on the edge who doesn't play by the rules. Where, like, everything he does is self-destructive and only makes things worse. But more than that, he is also meant to be sort of a dark reflection of uh, everybody's favorite Twin Peaks baby girl, Agent Cooper. Um, one of the very first things that he says in his notes is how he hate, ha hates how there's so many goddamn trees. And if you've seen Twin Peaks, you know that when we see Agent Cooper for the first time, one of the first things he talks about is how fucking beautiful he thinks all the trees are, and how enamored he is with them. Um, which is a lot of fun. I love Agent Cooper so much, honestly. Um... 
But something else that we learned from this is something that's kind of only assumed from, like, playing the game. With the way that <coughs> Nightingale likes to kind of throw his authority around and then when explicitly asked to speak to his uh, superior, he deflects. And that's that Nightingale is out here without um, FBI, without bureau support. Like, he mentions that he wishes he could have their resources, but then, like, they would start asking questions. Um, I think when we get further into this, and I think something that is also established in Control is that Nightingale basically just kind of, like, went out here on his own. Um, I think, specifically, um, he was given a paid leave of absence after the disappearance of his partner, um, who we further establish is named Finn. Um, now what exactly exactly what happened to Finn is generally left pretty ambiguous, but it seems pretty clear that he didn't explicitly die. Something happened back east, back on like the eastern US, and he's just gone. Um, and Nightingale blames himself for that. Now I've talked about this before, where part of the reason that Nightingale is so, like, gung-ho about Alan Wake is due a lot to the fact that he did find these manuscript pages that talk pretty explicitly about how... about all of these events in, like, Nightingale's life, in the life of, like, the pe lives of the people of Bright Falls... Um, to the point where Nightingale is realizing that Alan has some degree of control over his life, and thus some degree of responsibility for the things that are happening in it. And that's kind of where things with his partner come into play. Where it's like, if Wake is controlling all of this, if Wake is making all of this happen... Does that mean that Wake is responsible for Finn's disappearance? And in Nightingale's mind, that is a rousing yes, abso-fucking-lutely, I'm going to kill that motherfucker. <laughs> um, which then, of course, brings us to the events of Alan Wake. Now, another thing that Nightingale uh, constantly tell asks himself is just like is he going to have what it takes to do what he needs to to get the job done when the time comes Um, which he also kind of flip-flops back and forth on over the course of the game. Now, obviously, in their very first meeting, um, where, uh, you know, it's like, hey, uh, Nightingale rolls up with the police to Sparkling River Estates, um, he fires off a few shots at Alan, nearly hitting uh, Randolph, the, the owner, and then, of course, fires off again 
um, and almost hits Pat Main. Which, of course, says to me that the only way that Nightingale can confidently shoot his gun is if there is some kind of chance that he could hit an innocent civilian. Because then later on, he's got Alan dead to rights. Alan is, like, conked out on the couch, fucking drunk as shit, off magic moonshine. And, uh, he can't bring himself to shoot the guy. Just like, hey, Nightingale... Why were you so quick to start blasting when, like, there was the possibility that you could hit somebody who has nothing to do with any of this? Um. Uh. But when you have, like, a clear opportunity to kill just the guy you've been wanting to kill this whole fucking time, you can't bring yourself to do it. L little, little weird. Kind of, kind of cringe, honestly. Kind of messed up my duty. Yeah, exactly. Oh, something else we should mention. So Nightingale seems to think that the town is, like, kind of in Wake's thrall. He wonders if, like, everybody he talks to is kind of in on it. He mentions Wake really messing up Rose. And just overall, like, is very untrustworthy of pretty much everybody he meets. Which, given his specific damage and what he's worried about, does kind of make sense. Like, if you're concerned that there's a guy who's out there pulling the strings behind the scenes and causing everything bad that's ever happened in your life to happen, uh, who seems like he can control the things that people do, then obviously you are going to be pretty, oh god, fuck, pretty untrustworthy of most people that you find. But obviously not yourself. I mean, clearly... Clearly, like, everybody else is under Wake's control, but not Nightingale. No. Nightingale's fine. Nightingale has this on fucking lock. He does it. He really does it. He's, he's just as much of a character as anybody else is. He's a fool. Now, next up are some interviews that Nightingale conducted during his time in Bright Falls. Uh, at the start of this chapter, um, opposite the chapter title, there is a photo of Agent Nightingale in front of the Sheriff Department. Uh, this picture was obtained from nine-year-old Owen Kittle, an avid photographer and civil law enforcement enthusiast. So, Clay Stewart got a photograph from a nine-year-old bootlicker. You know how it goes. Kids these days. Uh, interviews. The following interviews with various citizens of Bright Falls were conducted by Agent Nightingale over the course of three or four days. Nightingale recorded each of them on microcassette, and I have transcribed them myself. It has been a painstaking process, as the sound quality on some of them is very poor. Some of the interviews were more successful than others, yet all show a reticence to speak about the town. All are included here, however, to form a more complete picture of characters and events. Most of them present Agent Nightingale in a very poor light, and I admit I considered leaving these out altogether. I have a great deal of respect for him, and believe they don't paint a complete picture of this deeply conflicted man. In the interest of honesty, I decided to include each one of them. I implore the reader to bear in mind that this is a man under tremendous pressure. I believe that, taken as a whole, these interviews reveal something of the tapestry of the town, and that tapestry cannot help but have an impact on the writer who was caught up in it, for better or worse. Okay, Clay, you don't need to fucking eat boot also. 
Like, for God's sakes, Nightingale sucked. Calm down. Unknown subject. It's unclear who the subject of this brief interview is. Agent Nightingale himself didn't appear to know. Accompanying notes indicate that he ran into the man in the Elderwood National Park while trying to find Alan Wake, but the circumstances are unclear. The interview was conducted outdoors, and judging by the sound quality and the tone of the interview, it's likely Nightingale surreptitiously turned his tape recorder on without the man's knowledge. There is a photo here of Mott, uh, Hartman's assistant from the game who pretended to be the kidnapper of Alice's, uh, of Alice, at the, for like the first three episodes of the, of the game. Uh, caption reads, Although the identity interview subject remains uncertain, townsfolk whom I've shown this photograph insist that it was a local troublemaker known as Mott. Been in a fight? What happened? It's nothing. You seen anything weird here? How about this guy, Alan Wake? He's not in his cabin. You know where he is? Have you seen him? The man laughs. Is that funny to you? You should leave this whole thing alone. You don't know what you're messing with. Is that right? And you do, huh? What's your name? What's it to you? You see this badge, buddy? I ask the questions. Government, huh? You gonna put me in the system, government man? Huh? Well, the new system's on its way. What do you think about that? I think you're gonna talk about this down at the station. A pause. You deaf? Let's go, buddy. If I still had my gun. What the hell did you say to me? Sounds of a scuffle, Nightingale grunts loudly, running footsteps recede. Get back here, you asshole! You're under arrest! A pause. Nightingale breathes heavily. God damn it! God damn it! Recording ends. Paul Randolph. I love your voices so much. Thank you. Paul Randolph is the manager of the Sparkling River Estates trailer park, where some kind of incident involving the police and Alan Wake took place. This sequence demonstrates Agent Nightingale's interview skills and a professionalism as he manages to coax an, uh, an obviously reluctant witness into cooperating with him. I can't help thinking that this is an echo of the man before the loss of his partner and the events that led to it. Uh, there's a photo here of Paul Randolph. Uh, caption reads, Paul Randolph avoiding eye contact as he stands in front of Rhodes Marigold's trailer. Interviewing Mr. Paul Randolph, manager of the Sparkling River Estates Trailer Park. I'm not sure I want to talk to you. Yeah, I've been getting a lot of that around here. Tough luck, we need to sort this out. You could have hit me. Sir, I'm a highly trained federal agent. You were no danger. Yeah, but someone said you were drunk. Who said that? A pause. Do I seem drunk to you? <laughs> huh? A pause. I... I guess not. These goddamn people. A pause. Okay, look sir, I know you had a scare and I'm sorry about that. I mean, you're the one who called the police. I know you're the good guy here. It's just that the man I'm after is real bad news. I had to take the shot, you know? I know you were just concerned for the girl. Rose, right? Yes, sir. Well, you know she's not doing too good right now, and if we're going to help her, we're going to need all the information you can give us, okay? Yeah, I guess. Well, those guys were in Rose's trailer for a long time, and I thought, wait a minute. Rose isn't that kind of a girl. What's that about? Because, you know, I've been in this business for a long time, and some girls, they, uh, do a little business of their own. Yeah, and I don't put up with that, you know? I tell him to move on. I'm no prude, but I don't want that in my place. But I knew Rose wasn't up to nothing like that, so it was weird these guys staying in her trailer like that. And those guys were... Yeah, Wake and the loudmouth and the puffy jacket. I don't know that guy, but I recognized Wake right away, because Rose is always going on about him. She gave me a couple of his books to read. He's pretty good. But I read the papers too, you know, so I know he gets in trouble a lot. Anyway, they were in there the whole goddamn day. Nobody ever even came out for a smoke or nothing, because I was working outside the whole time and I would have seen them. You hear anything? Talking? Arguing? Any noises at all? No, sir. I wasn't that close. I mean, the way these trailers are built, I'm sure I would have heard something if there was any shouting or anything like that, sure. But there wasn't nothing. 
And I knew she'd skip work today, too, so I got worried. I mean, it's not like it's not my business what people do in their own homes, but I know Rose pretty well. And I got to thinking that maybe she's in trouble. And the way you guys showed up, I guess I was right, huh? Uh-huh. Go on. Uh, I just got a real bad feeling about the whole thing, you know? Like a hunch, like something nasty was going down at her trailer, and, uh... Okay. So, I called the sheriff. Well, you did the right thing, sir. Recording ends. This is a really sort of... So, the, the soundtrack I've got running right now is, um from Alan Wake's American Nightmare. Um, and this particular track is like a very action-oriented like version of the Night Springs theme, which I think is really nice. I like hearing uh, motifs in like different kind of uh, ways like that. Like, I don't know if anybody's been watching, like keeping an eye out on like uh, Twitter recently, you know, if you haven't completely fucking abandoned it. Um, but people pointed out recently that uh, Gwen Stacy's theme from Across the Spider-Verse is just like an altered version of like the 60s Spider-Man theme, which I think is cool as hell. Uh, I'm hesitant. There's a part of me that wants to do like notes after each one of these because like especially in that last one there's a few things that we do that we do learn but maybe I'll just kind of like try and uh, take them one at a time uh, once we get to uh, the end of the interviews Rose Marigold Ms. Marigold appears to have great difficulty focusing on the topic at hand and is, o and is only with persistence that Agent Nightingale manages to reach her it's unclear what happened to her and the identity of the woman she refers to remains unknown I do find it touching that even though Nightingale appears to be unrelenting and brusque in his interactions with people, he's clearly affected by Ms. Marigold's distress. He genuinely feels her pain, and for a brief moment, he seems to put away his obsession with this case. There's a picture of Rose here. Uh, the blank stare of Rose Marigold in her trailer following an obviously traumatic event. Her repeated references to that lady and the woman in black indicate that Wake was not the perpetrator. Following is an interview with Rose Marigold, 21, an employee of the Oh Dear Diner in Bright Falls. A pause. Raise his voice. Rose. 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 Okay. My name is Nightingale. I'm a federal agent, and I need to ask you some questions. Okay. I hear you were seeing Rusty, is that right? The park ranger? I like... I like Rusty. He never shouts at me. I give him free coffee at the diner. Don't tell anyone. Or, I think maybe they know? Everybody likes Rusty. Something happened at Elderwood. We can't find Rusty. Do you know anything about him? Rusty. There's a pause. Hey, Missy, I'm losing patience here. I need some goddamn answers. Is it? Is it? Day or night? Why is it dark in here? Rose, this is really important. I need to ask you about Alan Wake. I'm his biggest fan. Yeah, I heard. He was at Elderwood, too. You know anything about what happened there? Why he was at your place? His new book's going to be the best possible roller coaster ride. Uh huh. What do you want with you? What happened? Marigold whimpers. Am I awake? Is this a dream? You're awake! Just answer my goddamn questions! I can't... Who was that lady? Oh god. She made me do it. What lady? What did you do? Did Wake hurt you? No! He wouldn't... I, I hurt him, didn't I? I betrayed him, I lied to him, I didn't want to. It was like it wasn't me, I kept screaming and my mouth wouldn't move. I still can't see right. I wasn't supposed to be like that, he was supposed to... She twisted it. Who? Do you mean his wife, Alice Wake? Was she there? The woman in black. It was about his manuscript. He wanted it back, I was just... We were supposed to talk about it. Discuss it, a literary discussion. With me! 
Are you screwing him? No! No, why would you... And he's married! He wouldn't do that, he's not like that! So what were you up to in your trailer? Marigold breaks down and starts to cry. I'm not a bad person. I didn't want to hurt him. Marigold's crying becomes more and more hysterical. She could barely speak. Oh, please, this isn't a dream, is it? I can't tell anymore. What's wrong with the world? Everything looks wrong now and the light hurts my eyes. Everything looks wrong. It's all wrong. There's a long silence. Marigold continues to cry. Okay. Hey, easy. I'm sorry. Okay, Rose? Shh. It's okay. Come on. Please stop crying. I won't ask you any more questions. It's like a crumb of something in my book. Hold on. What is that? Marigold continues to cry. Agent Nightingale apparently moves to comfort her. It's okay, honey. I'm sorry, huh? Everything's okay now. Shh. Recording ends. Barry Wheeler. It's unclear why Wake's agent Barry Wheeler is being interviewed, but clearly this is somehow connected with the events at the trailer park. I've tried to contact Wheeler several times, but he refuses to talk to me. After certain legal proceedings, I decided to abandon all of my attempts on that front. Uh, there's a photo of Barry here. Uh, an argumentative Barry Wheeler resists divulging any secrets about Alan Wake. Talking to Barry Wheeler, a literary agent. What's that? I'm recording this, I told you. How are you feeling, Wheeler? How do you think I'm feeling? I feel like shit. Did you arrest Rose? That's an ongoing investigation. Can't discuss it with you. You just worry about yourself here, Wheeler. Why? Am I under arrest? Not yet. Let's see if you can keep it that way. I got some questions about Wake. You're his friend, right? And his agent? We go back, yeah. Good guy. So you know where he is? How would I know where he is? You just said you, you're his friend. And agent. I don't know where he is. You don't. What about his wife? There's a pause. You mean Alice? Yeah. What? Does she have other does he have other wives? No, I was just Well, you know, she's missing. I know she's missing. You're friends with the Wakes, aren't you? There's another crumb of something here. What is that? Did I, like, spill something on this fucking book at some point? That's so weird. Snacks for later. <laughs> Sure, I told you. Al's an old friend. But not her? What? No, she's a friend. Look, we don't see eye to eye on some things, that's all. You sure you don't know anything? I mean, this whole thing, the way you're acting now, I start to get ideas. For example, say there's a marital problem. Maybe she stepped out on him. Wake found out, took it out on her. You're covering up for your meal ticket. What? Hey, happens all the time. I mean, I know you're not the other man, right? Can't see a woman like that going for you. Hey, I get plenty, buddy. Look, what's wrong with you? I got some bad coffee from Rose and passed out. Suddenly you're in my face with this crazy shit. Listen, I'm the injured party here. I'm the victim. I don't care about any of that. I just want... You don't care? What, is this below your pay grade, Mr. FBI? Well, maybe my lawyer will make you care, pal. God damn it, just tell me where Wake is. My psychic... Do I have a map in my pocket with a big X on it? Does he post status updates? Hell, by now, I wouldn't tell you if I did know, because I think you're batshit crazy. Believe me, I know crazy when I see it. Listen, Doughboy, how about... How would you like to be charged with obstruction of justice? Wheeler sputters. Oh, it's on now, man. It's lawyer time. I want my phone call. You haven't read me my rights. You're not even under arrest. Oh. Well, you're still a jerk. You're not arresting me? There's a brief pause. 
no. Well, then I'm out of here, jerk. Wheeler gets up and slams the door. Recording ends. Fucking love Barry. Barry's so fucking good. I hope he comes back in Alan Wake 2. Speaking of characters I love, Pat Main. Local disc jockey and radio personality Pat Main was obviously resentful of Nightingale, though it isn't quite clear why. Unfortunately, his reaction was somewhat typical. Very few Bright Falls citizens, if any, seem to respect Nightingale much. It's notable that the interview takes a strange turn at the end. Obviously, both Nightingale and Maine knew much more than they're saying, but neither party was willing to commit to saying it out loud. Uh, there's a photo of Pat Maine here. Uh, Pat, caption reads, Pat Maine at the offices of KBF Radio. I'm interviewing Pat Maine, local radio host. Thanks for coming in, Mr. Maine. Against my better judgment, you realize the only reason I'm talking to you at all is because Sarah asked me to. Yeah, I'm very touched by your agent. I'm not going to take any abuse from you. Not after our last encounter. Listen, that was all a misunderstanding. No, it wasn't. No, it was reckless, dangerous, and stupid. And you were in no condition to be working. Look, I'm... Can we just concentrate on this interview? Get it over with. Please, sit down. Brief pause. Please. All right. What do you want to know? What did Wake want with you? I have no idea. We really didn't have any time to talk. I thought he dropped in for an interview. We met on the ferry when he and his wife were coming into town, and he wasn't interested in one then. I said he should look me up if he changed his mind. Would have been a bit of a catch, especially with the Deerfest coming up. A celebrity would attract people outside of the immediate area. That's not why he was there. He said that. He couldn't say what he wanted before we were interrupted. If I hadn't said, if I hadn't said that he was at the studio on the air, things would probably have gone differently. Trust me, you got lucky. Wake's trouble. Really? I think I'm a fair judge of character, Agent Nightingale, and that's not the impression I got. Suit yourself. I did wonder if he had anything to do with the situation at the trailer park, but it seemed so unlikely. I suppose I was wrong about that. Even so, I can't imagine that anything Mr. Wake has done could be worth all this effort. You probably can't. Me? I don't have to imagine. That sounds ominous. It is ominous, Mr. Maine. Trust me on that. It's no joke. I've seen things you wouldn't believe. You should consider the possibility that your experience doesn't make you an expert or improve your judgment. It may not make you as unique as you think. There's a pause. What do... Are you telling me that you know what Wake is up to? Is that it? I don't know anything about Mr. Wake. Perhaps if you were to tell me what he has done... There's another fucking... What is this? Oh well, whatever. That relates to an ongoing investigation. I can't discuss it with you. Or the sheriff, or anyone else, it appears. You're friendly with the sheriff, huh? This is a small community, Agent Nightingale. It's obvious that you have no idea what you're doing. Crumbs of information. <laughs> I'm not trying to offend you, I'm just trying to tell you something important. A short pause. Please, Maine, you know something. I I need you to tell me. I need help here. Frankly, I'm not prepared to discuss that with you. I'm sorry, Agent Nightingale, but I don't trust you. But you trust Wake, is that it? I really don't know him at all. But he seems to be less of a loose cannon than you are. A pause. Get out of here. Just get the hell out recording ends. I wonder if that last one is supposed to be Nightingale saying that, but it says that it's Maine. <laughs> so that might be a, a misprint. Uh, Dr. Emil Hartman. This is the last of Agent Nightingale's taped interviews, apparently recorded outside the gates of Dr. Hartman's Cauldron Lake Lodge. I had a hard time making out Hartman's words, which came from a speaker. Again, Nightingale recorded this without the interviewee's knowledge, as the recording begins in mid-conversation. Unlike in the other interviews, Nightingale now sounds undeniably drunk, and his poor conduct here speaks volumes about the immense pressure he must have felt. There's a picture of Hartman here. This photo of Dr. Emil Hartman was used on the book jacket of The Creator's Dilemma. While he is dressed casually, note his rigid posture. So we actually heard uh, a bit of this conversation in the game. Um, this is the one that you can find the recording of uh, in uh, Hartman's office. Don't think that can be arranged right now. I'm afraid we're a little understaffed today, so I'm very busy. You should really make an appointment. 
I have reason to believe that there's a fugitive from justice on your premises. That's utterly ridiculous, Agent. You're not coming in. Listen, Hartman, you'd better cooperate here. I'm a federal agent. I'm well aware of that. Your reputation reached me long before you did. What's that supposed to mean? It means, Agent Nightingale, that you have demonstrated an unfortunate tendency to wave your gun around and go about your duties under the influence of alcohol. Did you really think no one would notice? You son of a bitch. Agent, I deal with substance abusers daily. You're a classic addict, unable to get through the day without drinking, yet living in obvious denial of your condition. You should seek help. Go to hell! What's your crutch, Agent? A discreet hip flask, perhaps? Did you, do you tell yourself it's nothing? He is an illuminating little experiment. Does the thought of pouring it all out on the ground make you a little panicky? What a cliché. Shut up. As you wish. Good day. There's a very long pause. Agent Nightingale breathes heavily and apparently attempts to collect himself. Then he sounds the buzzer repeatedly. Agent, this is completely unacceptable. I realize that your time isn't spent on anything constructive, but I have patients that need my help. Patients that are actually willing to work through their problems. We're not done yet, Hartman. I don't give a rat's ass about your patients. Is Alan Wake in there? No, I told you that already. Why do you persist with this line of inquiry? Not... I'm not buying that. I was tailing Wheeler, and this is the only place he could have gone. That means Wake is probably here too. Agent Nightingale, this is private property, and I will not allow you to disturb my patients. Yeah, I can get a warrant. That was your fragile little patients like that. <laughs> Hartman laughs. Oh, I'm thoroughly intimidated by your mighty authority now, Agent. Listen, you smug snob. How would you like it if I busted through this gate and knocked you around a little? Agent Nightingale, first of all, I'm recording this conversation, so you might want to watch what you say. Secondly, you're not dealing with a hick now. I know the law, and if you can get a judge to grant you a warrant, I'll be glad to cooperate. But you won't get one. Be advised that any further communications with me are to be made through my lawyer. I don't believe this. Good day, Agent. Agent Nightingale enters his car, followed by a scream of frustration and heavy thumps against the car's horn. Agent Nightingale then starts his car and drives away. Presumably he has forgotten that the tape recorder is on. He occasionally talks to himself, but the recorder can't pick up the words over the car's engine. The recording ends when the tape runs out. Fuck shit. <clears throat> uh, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, pop over the recap space real, real quick here. So we're going to go ahead and take these uh, one by one. So first interview, as established, is Mott. So this particular um, interview seems to take place pretty much immediately after um, Mott has met Wake at Lover's Peak. Uh, specifically because Mott mentions not having his gun. Um, there's not really a whole lot that happens here. Um, they argue a bit. Mott apparently slugs uh, Nightingale in the stomach um, and then runs away. But what's kind of interesting to note here, so, like, the fact that it's in here is really kind of just for, like, our benefit, us, the people that played the game. It's just like, oh, hey, there was a point at which Nightingale ran into Mott. Um, but what's more important, I feel like, to note here... Um, is the fact that very nearly the entire, like, Hartman's entire plan very nearly completely came undone. If Nightingale had been able to successfully bring Mott in, then that's it. 
there would have been like the the whole kidnapping plot. I have every confidence that Mott would have 100% cracked under pressure. Like the fucking like <clears throat> he was very clearly trying to play himself up um against Alan uh in their interactions but then like when he meets with somebody who can like genuinely like hurt him that like he doesn't feel confident about going up against uh take for example when he faces down Barbara Jagger uh at Mirror Peak um he just completely completely unravels and just lets everything fucking spill which is hilarious so I'm entirely of the opinion that if Mott had been brought in after this interview, um, half of the game's plot wouldn't have fucking happened. <laughs> now, of course, it's also important to note that... Um, so something interesting to think about here, actually, kind of before we get, in, get into the next part of this, um, is that they're really... There probably isn't any way that Wake wrote every single item that possibly happened, right? So, there are probably blank spots in, like, the uh, Departure Manuscript series of events where, like, what happens between those moments is particularly hazy, but they always have to reach the same conclusion. What I mean by this, of course, is that regardless of whether or not Mott ran into Nightingale, Mott goes to Mirror Peak. Mott goes to Mirror Peak and is killed by the Dark Presence. That happens. So the reason that I bring this up is that it is very interesting that Mott got out of this as easily as he seems to have. Because this seems to be the manuscript making sure that things have happened. Nightingale, we know, has a gun. Right? Like, we know because he used it to shoot at innocent civilians. <coughs> so, it's interesting to see this scene where it's just like Mott mentions not having a gun, which makes him an unarmed civilian uh which is the exact sort of person the nightingale would shoot at um that being said he doesn't seem innocent which is why nightingale decided not to shoot at him <laughs> um but it is kind of this interesting thing where it's just like after getting fucking slugged in the gut nightingale would have probably been very uh justified, at least in his own mind, of firing on Mod. Ekin Thorns, thank you for the follow. En Enchan? Encan? Is it a hard CH or is it a soft CH? Enchan? Oh, you know what? I bet it's like Enchanted Thorns. Am I right? Am I correct? Is it so is it like Enchan Thorns? Like Enchanted. Yeah, just splice the words together. Good shit. Welcome to the shark stream. Um, what was I talking about? Right. So it's kind of this situation where he can't arrest Mott. He can't fire on Mott. He can't bring him in because Mott needs to be at Mirror Peak. And if he had brought him in, something would have happened. What happened, Gage? I'm so sorry that I can't donate to help you with your medical bills. Oh, um, okay. So, um, yeah, if, if you've been, if, if you've been, uh, away from the stream for a bit, um, Natalie had a bit of a medical scare a few weeks back. She was in the hospital for about nine days. 
uh, and we are currently taking donations to help with bills and medical expenses. Um, considering that because of what happened, she's going to be out of work for a little bit. She's doing good, though. Um, she's actually working on uh, getting uh, set up to start streaming again herself. Um, oh, for fuck's sake, of course not I get in at. Ah, uh, ain't that just the way. All right. Until you're back, I will go ahead and uh, continue with this. But, like, if 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 Nightingale had... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? If Nightingale had taken Mott in, something would have happened that Mott would have gotten away scot-free. Because Mott needs to be at Mirror Peak. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, so what it is is Natalie um, had a bit of a medical scare recently, was in the hospital for about nine days, and is currently out of work uh, due to uh, her condition. I'm not going to go ahead and get into details with it, but we are taking donations to help with our bills and her medical expenses. Well, what the hell? Give me one second. All right, sorry about that. Uh, it was my job calling me, offering overtime. <laughs> um, what was I talking about? Uh, yeah, so um, we're currently taking donations to help with bills and medical expenses. Thankfully, um, we have really good uh, medical insurance, so things are manageable, but still pretty uh rough to deal with and also of course having uh less paychecks coming in um is also causing like you know issues with that so that's what the that's what the donations are for especially in this economy oh yeah for sure like i i don't know what we would have done if we didn't have the medical insurance that we've got like because the fucking healthcare in the U.S. is an absolute fucking nightmare. And, like, even what we're dealing with right now is still, like, tough to deal with. But yeah, um, so we're, we're taking donations currently. I actually have a donation drive I'm going to be running in a couple weeks. Um, so keep an eye out for that, because I'm really excited for that. I have a really good idea for it. Uh, and I want to, like, set up, like, a proper announcement for it. Um... But yeah, so uh, after Mott, we have Randolph. I hate Randolph. <laughs> this guy, like, okay, first off. Uh, he mentions how he's concerned about Barry and Alan being in Rose's trailer for as long as they are. Um, because he knows that Rose isn't that type of girl. And that he does sometimes have to deal with those types of girls. And he tells them to move on. Which... Okay, like... This paints a very clear picture of Randolph, because he also mentions in the game that he's a God-fearing man. So... He's... Probably a... Douche... <laughs> You're like, Rose is a good girl, she would never fuck! <laughs> Rose doesn't fuck! Fuck? Why would she fuck? She's not even married. You can't have sex before marriage. 
And then, of course, he goes on later in the interview to say, like, it's not my business what goes on in people's trailers. I just rent them. It's just like, okay, f hold on. So, first off, you tell people who are running sex work out of their trailers to move on, but then suddenly, when, like, they're not sex workers, it's, no bi it's not your business what they do in their trailers? Come the fuck on, man. Come the fuck- shut your fucking mouth. <laughs> Like, I hate this guy. I hate him. I think it would have been good if he had gotten shot. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. Like the like the book says, this also kind of shows um, uh, that Nightingale can, when he needs to be, be pretty professional. Like, Randolph is very clearly um, reluctant right out the gate to uh, talk with him just because, you know, Nightingale's kind of a shithead. Um, but then he manages to, like, de-escalate and be like, hey man, I'm just trying to help everybody here. Um, which, you know, jury's out on whether he's actually trying to help them or he's uh, hell-bent on revenge. But, you know, who are we to judge? We're the readers. We get to judge so much. We get to be so fucking judgy. It's great. I love it. It's my favorite part of reading, is being able to judge the characters. Just like, well, if I was in that situation, I wouldn't do this. Rip to this guy, but I'm different. <laughs> um, okay. So, Rose's interview is probably my favorite part of this book. This takes place after Rose has been used by Barbara Jagger to drug Alan Wake and Barry. Um, and it's pretty clear that the experience was incredibly traumatic for her. She doesn't know where she is. She doesn't know whether it's night or day. Light hurts her eyes. Um, and she is just breaking down over the course of the interview. Now, Nightingale starts off the interview his usual kind of like bullish self. But when he realizes what Rose is kind of going through, um, that immediately all melts away, and he starts to comfort her. Which is maybe one of the best moments for Nightingale, and is one of the moments where just, like, my sort of common uh, analysis of him as being just like an unrepentant shithead um, is tested a little bit. And part of this is probably because Nightingale mentions, I think it's brought up in this book, and I believe also to a certain degree in the novel, if I remember correctly, he mentions that his partner, Finn, dealt with some crazy shit before he disappeared that he also had like some strange moments of intense anxiety prior to his disappearance um it's possible that in this moment when rose is breaking down, crying, freaking out because she doesn't know what's happened to her or what's going to happen to her, that Nightingale was reminded of 
his partner, just before the end. It's unfortunate that he doesn't realize this in the moments before asking Rose if she fucked Wake. But he got there eventually. <laughs> um... After the interview with Rose is the interview with Barry. Hold on, I lost my marked place. One second. And the most important thing that we learn is that Barry fucks. Barry has canonically fucked and will fuck again. And that's a threat. Um, no, but, uh, this scene, there's not really a whole lot of, like, new information that comes out of this. It's pretty much just, uh, Nightingale's, like, bullish, stubborn personality coming, a coming up against, uh, Barry's kind of, like, wisecracking New York, uh, demeanor, and just watching these two play off each other like this is... A lot of fun. Um, there is obviously, like, the uh, potential um, accusation of, hey, did you help Alan kill and cover up Alice Wake's murder? But of course, since we know that's not true, it doesn't really, like, go one place or the other. Um, but yeah, not a whole lot really kind of revealed in this one just kind of reiteration that like he's barry is alan's friend and he is entirely unwilling uh to engage with nightingale's shit um going and just kind of like gets the last word in by calling nightingale a jerk which is really funny um but most importantly as we know now know barry fucks Barry fucks, has fucked, will fuck again. Um... Next interview is with Pat Main. Now the main in, the main the main thing that we uh, kind of get from the Pat Main interview is that this is a case of two people who know a lot more than they're letting on, um, kind of colliding up against that. So. Nightingale knows a lot about what's happening specifically with Alan because Nightingale is privy to the manuscript. He's found a number of pages. He knows that it has some degree of control over reality, whether it is a control of reality or whether it is just a, um, a, 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 a chronicle of events that haven't happened yet is not necessarily clear, but he knows that. He knows specifically what's going on with Alan Wake. Meanwhile, Pat Main, being part of like the fucking Bookhouse Boys-esque secret society in Bright Falls, um, uh, he's of course mentioned as being on the list that uh, Wheeler or Breaker, Sarah Breaker gives to Barry um, to call and tell people, hey, Night Springs. Um, Maine knows that Alan Wake is not the first weird fucking thing that has happened in this town. We're not talking that he's, like, full-on, um, like, aware... Like, he he's not Frank Breaker, former uh, agent for the Federal Bureau of Control or anything... But he has a decent idea of there's just weird shit 
going on in this town and it is not like the normal weird shit that small towns have to deal with, you know? Um, oh, my phone's battery's almost dead. Hold on, friend of the stream, uh, Lucas has put up a poll for his Patreon, and I need to vote on it. Come on, Flamedramon. Literally the only Digimon I generally care about. Flame Nirvan. Anyway. Um, so it's this interesting kind of like cloak and dagger kind of tennis game thing where it's just like Pat Main knows that weird shit happens in Bright Falls and he has some degree of familiarity with what sort of weird shit happens and where that weird shit comes from. But Nightingale knows specifically what's going on with Alan Wake. And neither one of them is willing to let the other one know uh, what they're talking about. Now, this, of course, comes after the fact of, uh, again, Nightingale fucking shooting at Pat Main and nearly hitting him. Um, so, uh, it's kind of understandable that neither one... And then, of course, Pat Main fucking reads in the Riot Act afterwards... And, uh, so it's kind of understandable that neither one of them is kind of willing to really work with the other. And then it was just like, oh, come on. That's how we say hi in New York. <laughs> um, so our last quote unquote interview here um, is with Hartman. Now, as I mentioned, this is actually an interview that we heard uh, part of in the game, though Hartman started recording uh much later in the conversation than Nightingale did. Uh, Nightingale started up a lot earlier. But it's basically um, just the conversation of Nightingale going to uh, Cauldron Lake Lodge and after, like, tailing Wheeler and being like, Yo, Hartman, I know Wheeler went in here. I'm assuming that means you also have Wake. I need to see them immediately. And Hartman, uh, being just like, hey, fuck you, buddy. I'm a smart guy. I'm rich and have written book. You can't get shit out of me. Um, basically just, like, kind of locking down on, like, lawyering up and saying, like, you're not gonna get a fucking warrant, you dumb idiot. <laughs> And part of this, because you have to wonder, at this point, Hartman has likely read a good chunk of Wake's manuscript, right? Like, Mott mentions having read parts of it. And then, of course, he pulled Wake out of uh, Cauldron Lake, and Wake had a bunch of pages on him. So there's a question of when Hartman says that Nightingale won't get a warrant, that the judge that a judge will not grant him a warrant. Does Hartman know that Nightingale is not here with Bureau support? You know. Like, that's kind of a big question. Does Hartman know that Nightingale is AWOL based on the information that he's found in the manuscript pages that he has? It's unclear. Um, but then, of course, Nightingale gets in his car and just 
this little piggy cries wee 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 all the way home, basically. Um, this one, this is another one where it's just like there isn't really any sort of like new information gleaned from this. Um, it's really just, hey, you know this conversation that you heard part of in the game? Here's more of it. And it's really just more of the same. It's really just more of like Nightingale, like being a drunk, belligerent asshole outside the gates of uh, Hartman's clinic and Hartman being a fucking smug idiot about it. Which again, very fun personalities to put up against each other. Alright, so this is going to be the last section of the book that we are going to go ahead and read today. This is the manuscript. It is unknown just how many pages make up the manuscript, but they potentially number in the hundreds. Based on my investigation, it is likely that Agent Nightingale had amassed more than what was present in the air vent, but the location of the extant pages remains unknown. My research in Bright Falls hit a dead end when it came to these pages. Although the provenance of the notes is unclear, their style is unmistakably that of Wake's. Just how or when these pages were written, or to what end, remains a mystery. Wake arrived in Bright Falls two weeks before Deerfest and had supposedly never been to the town before. How would he be able to write page after page depicting events related to the actual town residents? Some of these residents are now missing, while others did not care to comment and became quite aggressive when I persisted with my questioning. Whether the pages were predictive of future events or some complex incantation that caused the events to occur may never be solved to any degree of satisfaction. Uh, on the opposite page, uh, there is a shot of a ravine with a manuscript page in the foreground. Uh, caption reads, a sample of one of the manuscript pages in the location of its discovery. Now, these manuscript pages are uh, generally quite different from the ones that you find in game usually the ones that you find in game are serve a very specific purpose telling you about a specific event that has occurred is occurring or is going to occur um now the manuscript pages in the alan wake files uh will generally deal with other things going on in the town. Nothing specifically that happens in the story of the game. Um, and I think one or two of these are actually present in uh, between chapters in the novelization. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with these. I gotta, hold on, I gotta make a gross noise. Alright, I'm good. Four days after she reached the age of 26, Maggie decided her life was over. If asked to explain why, she could not have answered. If pressed, she might admit it had something to do with Samuel. How he had just left three months ago without a word, and how she had just seen him at a party, and how he had his arm around a beautiful girl she'd never seen before. It was more than that, of course. It was always more than that. That's why she was walking the seven miles to Lover's Peak. Teenagers had parties out here, and very occasionally someone would fall or jump. She hiked the trails wearing her old headlamp, following the bouncing ball of light like she was reading the lyrics to a song. When she reached the peak, she switched the headlamp off. If asked, she would say that she did not jump. She simply inched herself closer and closer to the edge until the inevitable happened. Eyes wide open, she fell rapidly, but death was quicker. In her last moment, she saw a great cloud of ink rise from the tree canopy and catch her like an insect in amber. It held her softly, the way Samuel once did, and by the time it brought her down to the forest floor to settle on her feet, it was as though she were reborn and ready to start her new life. Perhaps she would visit an old friend, and... Testing of soil residue on the page indicates it was indeed found near Lover's Peak. So these pages tend to be, like, distinct, like, vignettes. They are, it's not like a continuous story over the course of all the pages. Ellen shivered as the storm rolled in. A sweater and jacket would have been plenty to ward off the chill, but it was dark and suddenly so bitter that the stars looked jagged. A scientist should always be prepared, she chided herself. Ellen wasn't weird, no matter what the other 7th graders said. 
her mind just worked differently. Which was why she was sitting in the forest with her ears stopped and a mini tape recorder beside her. Soon, she would know the answer to the question. If a tree falls in the middle of the forest, and there's no one around there to hear it, does it make a sound? Extra credit. The alder trees rattled against each other and the wind like finger bones. Soon as the storm toppled one over, the recorder would provide the proof if it actually made a sound when it fell. She shivered again, her breath frosty. She looked around, trying to get her bearings, but everything seemed tilted and out of place. Even the stars were blinking out, like somebody pulled the plug on heaven. Found half buried in the forest, this page required forensic washing to be legible. Nothing to cover herself but the shadows that overwhelmed her, she reached for the light switch in desperation. She cringed and crossed her arms against her chest, hugging her own body close, bracing for the onslaught. Squeezing her eyes shut, she shuddered as she felt the darkness fill her, chasing away every hope, attacking her, even her memory of her own identity. The alarm of the invasion caused her to cry out involuntarily, which only sped the inevitable. Her descent into despair hurtled like a pitch-black boulder thrown down a dark mine shaft. Her cries came out in a muffled choking sound. In her ears, she could hear what sounded like a monsoon crashing its devastation inside the cabin. Outside, there was near silence. The elderly couple who walked by heard nothing of the internal storm that raged only a few yards away. It's cold, the old woman said to her husband, suddenly very cold. Her gray curls shook as she shivered. The old man smiled. You're always cold, he said. There did seem to be an extra breeze through the forest. He slipped his jacket off and put it over her shoulders, thinking he was rescuing the nearest damsel in distress. Accompanying notes indicate this page was found on the Elderwood Nature Trail, near the tree known as the Great Old One. Worst vacation ever. Two weeks off, a year, and Blaine had to spend it driving around in an RV with his in-laws from Tokyo. People acted like they had never seen a redwood tree, and his mother-in-law found every jerkwater town cute. Nothing cute about Bright Falls, just redneck dopes asking him what kind of mileage he got in the Winnebago. Didn't help that his wife, Asako's spastic colon, was kicking up with all the fast food, making her totally useless. It all fell on Blaine. He wanted to barrel on to Longview or Portland, someplace with a sizzler and a multiplex. But his in-laws had seen the mountain turn out and wanted to stay and watch the sunset. Like the sun never set in Japan. Fine, Blaine stayed in the RV while the three of them stood against the railing taking pictures. Jeez, it got dark uh, fast up here in Nowheresville. Hardly see a thing. One minute it was twilight, and the next? The rest is burnt and illegible. Page reportedly found beside an abandoned RV. Now, this particular... Uh, oh, let's go ahead and let's read uh, the last couple. I just dropped my fucking bookmark. Anyway. Bill rocked on the porch of his cabin as the last of the light faded, listening to his stomach growl. When his little brother disappeared 26 years ago, at least Bill got dinner. Oh sure, folks had traded tales of screams in the night, and nothing but a smear of blood left behind, and poor Timmy this and poor Timmy that. But Bill had insisted the brat must have gotten lost or fallen down a well. Timmy was always careless, always sticking his nose in places it didn't belong. Clara was the same way. Bill's wife. Clara never liked the cabin, always worried about being so far from other folks. Always seeing things in the trees, always asking him dumb questions. Now Clara had disappeared too, snatched away an hour ago, leaving a pan of meatloaf fixings on the table. The night deepened, but Bill maintained the same unhurried rocking. He liked the gathering darkness, the way the shadows piled up on each other. All these years and he never missed his little brother and he wouldn't miss Clara either. He would miss her meatloaf, though. Page found near an abandoned cabin in the woods north of Cauldron Lake. Beedle -de -de if Donnie Ray thought Darlene was going to fall for that, I ran, I run out of gas nonsense. He had another thing coming. She had slammed the door of his 4x4 so hard it about cracked the window. She didn't care. Donnie Ray did, though, running after her, yelling who did she think he was. Darlene knew who she was. 
She was the one, she was the one staying, saying shove it to Donny Ray, which is why she lay hunkered down in the weeds, listening to the crickets while Donny Ray thrashed around in the darkness, bellowing about what he was going to do to her if he found her. Crickets got real quiet, but Donny Ray didn't notice. Darkness boiled up from the trees, and he didn't notice that either, not even when it rolled right towards him. Heart pounding, Darlene eased towards the road and started walking quickly back to town. She promised herself she wouldn't run, wouldn't panic, wouldn't... The rest is blurred and illegible. Notes indicate this page was found in a ditch, alongside Route 21B. Alright. So, as I said, um, a number of these actually show up uh, between chapters in the novel. Um, the one about uh, the girl Ellen uh, trying to find um, out if uh, if a tree falls in the woods, no one's around to hear it, doesn't make a sound. Um, the one about the guy whose wife gets snatched up out of the darkness and he's reminiscing about his brother having the same thing happen. And then, of course, the guy uh, driving through Bright Falls with his in-laws from Tokyo. Um, now, I should note that that last one uh, in the book is shown as the end of it being burned off. Um, this is kept consistent with the version that's actually in the novelization where there's just like a cutoff uh, in the, during the bit about how like it gets dark really quickly. Now, you may notice... Uh, hold on, let me go ahead and get over to our uh, recap space here. Now, you may notice that all of these um, disparate uh, scenes that were given seem to have a common theme. Everyone involved in these scenes was taken. Um, we have some, like, pretty explicit ones where it's just, like, you know, the darkness rolls in and claims somebody. We've got a few that are more ambiguous, where it's just, like, the landscape is weird and wrong. Um, but, like, more so than anything, like, it's pretty clear that the darkness took these people. And each time... Each of these seems to be, like, indicative of, like, where this happened and, like, who exactly was taken. So, like, uh, there's the abandoned RV. Clearly, everybody got God in that one because it was abandoned. Uh, there's the one about the uh, woman not able to get to turn the, turning the light on uh, being found near an abandoned cabin. I like the sore spot on my elbow. What's going on with that? Anyway. Um, beyond that, there really isn't a whole lot going, going on with these. But the kind of pages that Alan finds versus the kind of pages that Nightingale finds does seem to sort of... What's the word I'm looking for? Um, suggest that there is a deliberateness to which pages that they're given, right? Alan's pages all seem to have some kind of relevance to whatever is happening at the given moment, right? 
um, talking about, like, oh, hey, here's what's going to happen in a little bit. Here's how you, uh, can here's something that can help you in, like, the upcoming encounter. Here's some information about, like, the person you just met or the person who is about to die or the person who is affected in this moment. Um, I think about, like, uh... I think one of my favorite sort of, like, pages that you find juxtaposed with, like, the event actually happening in-game is you find the page about the lights going out in, um, the police station, uh, when Barry is the only one there, um, and how this happens just before he texts you, uh, in the moment like, moments before actually receiving text, the text from Barry. Um, Nightingale's pages seem to have, have a very different focus. Raggy, hey, no tearing up the carpet. Stop that. Also, hi. Raggy trying to scratch up the carpet. Hey, what did I just say? Oh, see, you're stuck now. Can you get your claw out? Do you need help? There you go. Come here. Come here. We have a deposit on this place, little boy. Um. Nightingale's pages seem to document the manuscript's body count. The people who are falling to the darkness, the people who are dying as a result of the story that Alan has written. So this just sort of, the fact that what Nightingale is getting from these pages is the people who are victimized by this manuscript is therefore reinforcing his resolve to stop Alan Wake, like making it... Oh, is that why you're scratching that up? You found, like, a little piece of... A little strip of, like, paper envelope that you're trying to get? Hold on. Play with my cat break. One second. <laughs> uh, do I have anything I could play with right here? Hold on. Let me... One second. One second. scratch up tile. I mean, you can scratch tile, but you can't, like, tear it up. Um, what was I saying? 
So Nightingale's pages really just kind of like bring his motivation out of being entirely personal and reinforce it and give him the resolve to pursue Alan Wake, thereby forcing him to fulfill his role in the story. Uh, which in this case is a victim of the Dark Presence. Um, a constantly obstructive force that in the end is uh, killed off to add to the drama, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I say killed off, but of course we know who knows what's fucking going on with Nightingale. Um, but that's where we're going to go ahead and uh, close out today. We're about halfway through the Alan Wake files. Uh, so we will be sure to finish that up next week. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming by the stream. I hope you all had a good time. I know I did. If you enjoyed the stream, you can subscribe here on Twitch. We have special emotes for subscribers. You can follow me on uh, Twitter, Tumblr, and co-host at AcidXShark. That's A-C-I-D-X-S-H-A-R-K, where I post all the streams as they happen. Uh, and you can follow me on YouTube at AcidXShark, where I post all the streams after they happen. Uh, art for the stream... Um, PNG Tuber was done by Audrey and B of Team Capel. You can find on Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube at Team Capel. And also co-host now, I think, as well. They set one up. I don't know if they've started using it yet. Um, they do fantastic work. Uh, they're open for commissions. If you want a commission, they have a commission form on their card that you can fill out. Uh, don't email them. They'll email you. Um, if you must DM them, don't be weird. Please don't be weird to my friends. Um, upcoming streams. Uh, tonight, Gollum. Gollum, Gollum. Gollum, Gollum, Gollum. Um, we are uh, continuing our... I think we're continuing escaping Mordor? I don't know. We ended up back at Gollum's, like, home sweet cave from the beginning... Uh, so who knows what the fuck is about to happen in that game. I sure don't. I know there's parts of that game where you run around Rivendell. I know there is. I don't know when they happen, because we're halfway through the game at this point. There's ten chapters, and we finished chapter five last week. Um, but you can tune in. Check that out. Uh, that is bound to be a fucking experience as Gollum often is uh, tomorrow is going to be Sinking City in the afternoon with uh, Bayonetta 2 Sinking City with JB in the afternoon Bayonetta 2 with Audrey and B in the evening uh, Saturday we'll be finishing up Fatal Frame made in a black water um, and then next week uh, will be more Hyrule Warriors on Wednesday. We've got the Deep Yet Casual Link costume, so I will be uh, using that, I'm sure. For Audrey's sake. Um, and then we will wrap up uh, Alan w the Alan Wake files. The week after that is uh, when I'm going to be trying to do my big um, donation drive. So, depending on what I'm finishing this week, there may be additional days next week that I go ahead and take off just to kind of give myself some rest time uh, before I, like, start in on the donation drive. There's also a few things I want to go ahead and set up for it. So, uh, kind of keep an eye out for that. Um, let me think. I think that's it for now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here, and I'll see you next time on the Shark Stream. Same Shark time, same Shark channel. Take care, everybody.